All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Kurt Robinson, president of Robinson Helicopter Company, and I uh, welcome you all and thank you all for coming uh, to the uh, Robinson Helicopter Briefing. Uh, I know I've seen many of you down at our booth, and hopefully everybody's had a chance to, to stop by and, and see the helicopters and all the products that we're offering. I'm going to go through and touch on a few of those, give you a little update on the last year or so of what we've done, and then I'll open it up to any questions uh, that I can answer for you. Um, last year, 2019, was, was a little slower year for Robinson. Uh, we delivered a total of 196 helicopters, uh, which is about 100 less than we had done the year before, so we saw a slowdown. Uh, it's interesting because it was kind of uh, the same worldwide, and whether it's a percentage that went down in the United States was si same as the percentage that went down overseas. Uh, we had about 72% of our deliveries were outside of the U.S., and 28% or a total of 56 aircraft were in-state, which percentage-wise is the same as it was in the prior years. There's a lot of different explanations. I've heard everybody play different economists on what is happening, but just in general, we just saw it as, as a little bit slower year. Um, the sales breakdown was a total of 19 R22s, 54 R66s, and 123 R44s. That's all of the 44s combined. That's uh, 82 Raven 2s, 29 Raven 1s, and 12 cadets that we did. Um, the leading sales occurred once again in Australia, followed by Canada and China. An interesting thing to note is the last couple of years, China has been slowly moving up the, the chain, um, and we're seeing sales start to, to pick up there. Um, one of the things that we've noticed, though, in the last two to three months is we've definitely seen a bit of a sales uptick. Uh, and again, I, I don't really have a good logical reason, except that uh, uh, we're seeing uh, worldwide our orders have picked up. And based on that, we set our production rates uh, for the year. And currently, we're producing uh, one R22 per week, two R66s per week, and three R44s per week. At that current rate, we're actually sold out the first six months with both the R44 and the R66, something that wasn't occurred last year. So we are definitely seeing uh, a steady increase in orders, and in particular the R66, which we're obviously very pleased to see. Um, one thing we're seeing, and we'll see it in the next probably three months, is we will deliver the 1,000th R66, which is a pretty big milestone, and uh, we're... Uh, Please report, as I seem to do every year, that there has been no major problems with the aircraft. Uh, it's flying out there and doing well. I've had a chance to talk to many owners today in all sorts of climates all over the world, and it's really fun to hear uh, their experience with the aircraft. And at least the ones that have all come up to me have been very, very happy with it. And so we're, we're very uh, pleased on that. Um, last September, you may remember, we issued a press release when the cumulative flight hours on the R-66 surpassed 1 million flight hours uh, without a single reported in-flight engine failure. Uh, based on the engine utilization rate, Rolls-Royce, who monitors the EMU and the time on the aircraft, has advised Robinson that the current cumulative fleet hours on the R-66 is now over 1.1 million flight hours. Okay. So we seem to be doing very well over 200,000 flight hours a year on the 66. The aircraft is doing amazingly well all over the world, and we're very uh, uh, proud of that. Uh, one of the reasons we like to think that our sales are, are doing, are, are upticking and getting better is because of our lead in, in uh, product and support. We remain ranked number one in product support surveys, and last year, uh, we opened in July, we opened a new 38,000 square foot facility dedicated to the component and aircraft inspections and teardown facility, uh, which is now in full operation and has made a, a tremendous assistance in getting uh, parts and components turned around for customer out in the field. We understand that most people that use our helicopters, they make money with them, and it's very important that they not be down. Um, and so we, everybody there, one thing I have noticed is if people call in, they know that we will push parts, we will get things done, and make certain that they can get in the air as quick as we can. And so we continue to make investments in that to make certain that uh, that, that will occur. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to mention 
on, on a, is obviously our, our safety department, flight safety. It has been run now for over 30 years by Tim Tucker, who's been our chief flight instructor. Tim has been everywhere and done everything. And for the last several years, he's been spending a little bit more time um, with the, uh, the US helicopter uh, safety team, with the FAA, he's been on some committees helping um, trying to update the basic helicopter handbook, some of the, the current testing and things. And it's something that we feel is invaluable. And Tim has requested that he spend more time on that. And he has our total blessing with it. And we're very proud to see him spend more time there. He's still going to be teaching the course, but he won't be doing it full time. And he's going to not be doing the administrative duties. Uh, for that, we actually look to, to our longtime assistant chief flight instructor, who will now become the chief flight instructor over this year, is Bob Muse. Uh, many of you, if not all of you, know who he is. Uh, and Bob has been um, he's been in this involved with us and in this industry for over 35 years. And Bob has himself over 20,000 accident-free flight hours in 13 different helicopter models. He's flown all types of missions. And of course, as we know, he set up the flight programs at several police agencies. Um, so this is just kind of a, a smooth, a little bit of a backing up, but it's so that we can give Tim Tucker a chance to do more, uh, to be involved with safety kind of for the whole industry um, as well as ourselves. And, uh, you know, we're, we're confident uh, that everyone involved in this industry is going to continue all that we can to ensure the safety and encourage safe and smart flying. And I think that's just a, a part of it and part of our commitment towards that. All right, now on to the things that I know a lot of you came here for is like, what have we done lately? Okay, um, some of the things you have seen uh, one of these we've, we've announced, and we actually have the slimline fuel tank, the one on the left, um, is our one-hour fuel tank available for the R66. We also have had the, the two-hour fuel tank on the right that's been available. This fits in the baggage compartment. Uh, if you go down to the show, you will see the slimline one that's available there. This has proven to be a very popular option. Uh, people just seem to love having extra fuel. And uh, no matter in some of the countries and places that they operate, uh, obviously with the slimline now I have a four-hour endurance, and if I go to the uh, to the regular ox tank, I have five hours of endurance on there. We're finding that over 60% of our aircraft that these order that are ordering with this uh, with this additional tank, one of the two, uh, on there, and. It's also to be noted that if you order one, you can also get the other one and swap them back and forth. Uh, and I'm, I had several requests at the show to do that, and we'll be coming out with a kit with that really shortly. Um, I realize how much people want it. Um, the other item that we have I was just done is we now are approving the shade and fuel flow meter, um, as long as we're talking about fuel. Uh, it provides real flow time data to the Garmin GTN GPS receiver, allowing it to calculate fuel remaining based on pilot entered uh, starting quality. The GPS display can then present fuel range rings uh, on a movie map display on there. That's something that is requested. Uh, actually, our dealer from Brazil has bugged me about that now for several years, and I'm really pleased to... Uh, to state that we have it uh, for the management and trying to get more information to the to the pilot. One thing that's uh, uh, that you may also want to see down, it's on the 66, is we have little boarding steps. And we've had some people that make it a little easier to get in and out of the ships. And you can see those down there as well. Um, for 2020, now, all the R22s and the R44 are going to be equipped with um, Engine overspeed protection. Uh, this is uh, protection during startup. If the pilot opens the throttle too wide before he starts it and you have the engine surging, not that any of us have ever done that, um, but if the RPM exceeds 90% during start, uh, there's a special circuit that will now cut the ignition. All right, so it'll basically just kill it and you gotta restart it. Hopefully the pilot realizes that he had the throttle in the wrong direction, especially since it's revving up on him. For there. Um, this switch only works when the clutch switch is disengaged 
and when the rotor RPM is, is below 50%. So both of those conditions have to be met for it to do it. So it's a fail-safe mechanism to ensure that nothing can ever happen in the air. But I think it will uh, save some people, especially flight schools and stuff, you get the nervous student who just forgets which is which on the open and closed on there. And I know we've, we've seen some of those. Um, the next uh, thing that we have that will be uh, standard equipment on all the 2020 aircraft is now we will have both a TAC and engine monitoring unit. Um, and this unit will actually, it, it's fed into the governor and it actually monitors the TAC RPM, the engine RPM, the oil temp and the cylinder head temp. Okay? If you noticed on the ships and on the floor, you'll see that the old light bulbs are all gone. Um, and now we have an enunciator panel. And to the right of the enunciator panel, there's a little right white button. If you push that and you have a, a Bluetooth iPad, you can actually bring up this screen right here. And what this will do, and you notice here, you can have several aircraft on the left. Obviously the top one there, you can see it's connected to Bluetooth and it will tell you the status of the aircraft if there's ever been an exceedance um, and if so, what the issue is. In this particular case, if you look, and if your eyes aren't good, like mine aren't, it's tough. This one has an oil temperature. It shows that it's exceeded. It gives you the, uh, the date of the exceedance. It gives you the temperature. It shows you the limits that you're allowed. So it's some really good information that you can have that up until now has not been available. Uh, you go to lease or rent an aircraft and j jump into it. You don't know what's happened before you. Uh, this will now provide you with that information, uh, particularly with like rotor speed or engine speed RPM. The light will only flash when you push the button, so if you're in the air, it's not going to be an annoyance or anything like that. It's set up somewhat similar to the, what we have in the R66 with the R300 on there. It, uh, um, it can only be completely reset by a mechanic, and they can plug into it, and the mechanic can reset it from that date forward so that when you push the white button, it will not show that you have an exceedance because he's already done whatever maintenance is required on there. But a mechanic can, using his laptop, can go on it and actually see the entire data history of the aircraft. And if there's been previous exceedances, it'll give them that information. Uh, probably would be kind of nice if you're buying a new aircraft, right, at some point or a used aircraft out in the field on this. Uh, what's also nice about this is this will now comply with YASA's regulations for all commercial operations in Europe, which has been asking for this. So this, this fully meets that on there. Um, the next item that we have, and we have this on all three sh aircraft down in, in display, this is a cabin video requ recorder. This particular one, you'll see it's installed on an aircraft, I believe on the Cadet, that has no air conditioning on it. And now you see the one that's installed with the air conditioning. This unit is mounted uh, towards the, the top there where the headsets go. You can see on there, there's a little uh, memory stick um, up towards the top there, that's removable. And then you'll notice if you look right below it, you'll see two buttons. One says re record, and then the next one says audio. If the record is on, then it will actually record the video in the cabin and also outside. If you have the audio on, it will pick up all correspondence that you have on your headsets, including that with the towers um, there. For, as a training device, we think it'll be excellent uh, for people to use. Um, and it can, obviously, we've actually spent several years working on it. One of the biggest tricks was getting the depth of field right so that you have a very dark um, instrument panel inside, but then you have um, the lightness outside or at night, it's just the opposite. Where it's dark outside, we have an instrument panel inside. Um, here it'll be just, uh, you can see it right here, that you pick it up. This is actually a 4K camera system, so it's very high quality. It is, uh, what, 60 frames per second, I believe is what is normal, the normal recording uh, speed on there. So it, can, it pick, picks up what you see and then you can see outdoors. Just to give you just a glimpse of what it is, and we do show more of this video down in our, in our booth, you'll see here what, what you're gonna see and pick up.
So again, we think this is gonna be an excellent training aid for a lot of flying. Um, also, anybody that's taken somebody on tours, the, uh, the memory stick actually holds five hours of memory and it includes not only the, the video, the audio, but also the GPS location. It records that. So you can really tie where you're at with what you're seeing on the video. So it's, it's a lot of useful information on there um, that you can have. So um, I think that's, I don't think I missed anything on that. Um, the next item that we have been working on, and we just literally recently completed it, is a, uh, an impact resistant windshield. And I'm showing you this slide so that you can see along the nose there, you can see the reinforcements and stuff that were done uh, on it. This has been just recently completed. It is a, uh, um, it's made of polyurethane. It replaces the acrylic that's in the windshield. And we were, uh, it adds only actually about 1.2 pounds to the total weight of the aircraft. Uh, if you're flying in, a, in an area invested or infested with birds uh, or other items that you're worried about, um, it's kind of nice to have. Uh, the windows were designed in accordance with Part 29, and they're designed to deflect a two-pound bird in the 44 in the R66 at 100 knots and at 90 knots in an R22. And to give you an idea of uh, some of the testing and things that we went on, uh, this is actually a 2.2 pound bird. This was shot at 100, uh, simulates 115 knots flying, and you'll see a bird come and hit it. And that's what it looks like. If you did that with an acrylic windshield, it just goes right through the windshield. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, pretty cool. Um, but if, if that doesn't get you, we took one of our strongest engineers and asked him to break it. And uh, this is his attempt at breaking the windshield with a sledgehammer. Okay, this is his Elon Musk moment. So it's pretty impressive. If you fly in an area heavily invested with birds, you may want to look into this. You can see all the attachments and everything are, are um, they're visible, but it's a trade-off, and uh, we think that it'll be fairly popular. Um, on the R66 and 44, I believe it's a, a $6,800 upgrade uh, on there. Uh, again, if it's, if it's in an area where you hit a bird, it becomes priceless, right? So, the other things that we've uh, uh, been working on at the factory is, is one of it with, uh, with all this urban mobility and stuff, there's been really a lot of discussions of where people can land and what they can do, and a lot of people have questioned us, questions about heliports and, and how people can land and everything. So we have actually um, came up with this helideck prototype, which we built, and it's sitting in front of our uh, delivery center on there, and it's to, to give us some ideas and stuff on what we can do to land and to help uh, get the helicopter up above people where it's safe, where you're not going to have people walking in the tail rotor, where you can load and unload easy. Uh, the, the, this particular structure is elevated 10 feet high. It's the, it uses our normal 20 by 20 foot uh, landing surface that we've had available for years, and it includes also a six foot perimeter safety area with chain, as you can see around there. Um, this, current, this rooftop right here has a limit of 3,000 pounds, but it's actually designed so that if you wanted to add another I-beam or so, you could probably easily increase that to say 4,000 pounds or somewhere in that range on there. Um, the, the staircase structure is, is uh, four feet wide. It's not something that is completed or approved. We've been getting a lot of comments on it and we're landing and taking off on it and playing, out, playing with it. If by chance you have nothing to do in the next few days and want to swing by the factory, we're only about an hour's drive away from here, we are doing tours, and we would invite any of you to, uh, to go to the factory, take the tour, and they'll show you the, the helideck out there so you can see it. Um, this is our idea. We parked a couple cars on there and just trying to get a, a proof of concept with it. So pretty much with that, that's my, uh, my brief presentation here. And now if I, I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions or anything that people may have. Um, he's asked me to update status on the diesel engine. Um, we are very much still working on it. Uh, I've got some engineers that are a bit of perfectionists that work really hard and we're working with different vendors and really there's a lot of different variables that we're working with, whether it's heating, whether it's vibration. Um, 
And we continue to work on it. We're actually very pleased with the progress. Obviously, I didn't talk about it in my, in my update because we, we're not at the point yet where, where we can see a, a certification line or whatever, but we do continue to work on it. And we're actually, we're, we're pleased in one sense with the progress, but we all agree it's going too slow. But at the end of the day, if we get what we want, we'll be happy. Uh, he asked us what work we're doing, if any, with the electric-powered Robinson. You saw Tier 1 Aviation has their, their little their R44. It's in our static booth back there just to kind of show what's possible. We have been working and talking a lot to the different battery manufacturers. Uh, certainly, we're agnostic as to how our aircraft is powered. Uh, we've been very pleased to see, like, the 22 has been used for drone. I think Israel has one and some other, several other applications. Um, on there. If and when electric becomes viable, I'm not sure it's there yet, but I'm certainly not going to rule it out. And I think it's a question of when, um, but it's certainly not anything on the short horizon. Uh, we would jump over to it fairly quickly uh, on it. Um, but at this point in time, I guess we're content to let see what happens and see where it goes. And then we'll, we'll, we'll work on that as we, as we go forward. He asked what the status is of electronic ignition. <laughs> it's really, it's really good. Um, it, it actually, it, it is. Um, and we just got a phone call from the FAA, uh, Jesus, just a few days ago on there. Um, we expect they will receive their certification very, very, very shortly, in which case I think within, boy, certainly within a couple months. And of course, I say that, but you have to get FAA approval, right? Um, but we have been just dying to get this done. It's very close, is all I can tell you. And we're very pleased with what we've seen. And we really wanted to have it for the show, but it's, it's not here yet. But I, I think you'll, you'll see something, you know, certainly within the first six months. But if not, I would expect sooner. On the EMU, that's going to be very difficult because actually there's a lot, a lot of the gauges now are different. They may look the same, but they're actually different. There's a whole new wiring system and a lot of data has to feed into it. That's one of the reasons why it took us a while to do it. I don't see on the EMU being any time quickly, maybe if it came in for overhaul. The, uh, the overspeed protection, that would require just the, a new tack and then poss possibly some wiring. We have not developed a kit. In fact, we're just pushing to get everything certified and out. Um, but something I think down the road we will probably look at and do. Uh, but the EMU is a little bit trickier because it, it, it does require quite a bit of wiring changes and instrument changes. I mean, if you bring a ship to the factory, I can do anything. But, you know, it's kind of tough. We have had, um, he asked about the cargo hook and the sales uh, of the cargo hook. Um, I don't have the exact numbers of it. I know that we've got, uh, boy, at least three or four out there placed in different areas, including Canada, um, and I know in the United States, and I think there's one in Indonesia. Okay, oh, and he has two, so there you go. Uh, that's down in Chile. So um, it, it's... It's one of those that I think we'll pick up, but yeah, it's, it's, that, that's about where we're at at the moment. So, yes, sir. Will the fuel flow for the 66, will there also be another gauge for fuel remaining? Or would you change someday to a complete electronic engine monitoring? That is, it's actually tied into the, uh, to the, the GTN. Um, and I can't remember whether it not it, it shows fuel remaining on there or not. Um, I'll have to when we go back to the booth, I can check that, but I can't remember uh, exactly what it has. If you're familiar with the, the shade, and it, it does exactly that and what as it feeds to the Garmin on there. I think it might, but I'm not sure. So, yes, sir. Would it be a possibility if you hear something like fuse start? There could be. I mean, that's something that we could look at. We have, up till now, we really don't like um, s 
switching or getting them off, off, you know, you like them to be the same or similar on there. So it makes it more predictable on maintenance. It's certainly something at some point we could, we could look at and evaluate, but I'll be honest and say that we, at the present moment, we don't have any plans to, to change the hours on the aircraft. We're just happy to keep building time on it and work on uh, any little issues or things that we find. So there's a question in the back. Last time I checked just a few, a little bit ago, the R66 did not have a calendar time for overhaul listed. It still said reserved for future expansion. Do you know if that's going to change, and if so, when, in terms of 12 years, yes or no, on the calendar? The, the R66, uh, my recollection, I'll have to go back and look at a book, is that it, still, it has the, the blades and everything still have a 12-year life. Blades do, but the airframe overhaul, both in the 44 and 22, that part of the manual says 12 years regardless of hours flown. That part in the 66 says reserved for future decision. We, well, basically what we're looking at and what we're, what we're walking through is as we get, and you're right, we're starting to come up closer to 12 years because um, we started coming out in 2011, is to see what components, we didn't want to come out in the very beginning and just say, okay, be the exact same as a, 20, as a 44. We were looking at the different components and, and getting the age and experience on them to see if there's going to be any change in lives or anything right now. Right now, the blades are, are the main components on there. Uh, you could also look at fuel bladders as a possible one, but we, we will need to kind of pull some of those out and do it. We don't want to just put something on there and say replace it. We'd really r rather uh, take a look at some of this, and now as we're starting to get some experience, we will probably come out with that shortly. But actually now that you brought that up, I'll make a note of that um, so that we, we start addressing that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. This is kind of the height deck. Is that for the offerings to the customers? <laughs> We're not sure. Um, we're, we're looking at it. A lot of it is overall what's going to be the cost of it, what's the delivery. One of the things that engineering did was that they wanted it to be designed with off-the-shelf components. One of the thoughts was it's not our main, you know, area that we work on, but we wanted to be able to say, look, if you want to build one, here's how you do it. Um, you can order the parts. If we get a lot of demand for it or if we feel like we can – somehow drive the price down or provide it out there, then we will. Other than that, we may say, look, here's, here's the drawings, here's how you order it. Um, I mean, you got chain link fence, you got, everything is pretty much very standard that you can order. And that's kind of the phase that we're in right now, is trying to see, uh, solve the problems that people have with this, this urban mobility that everybody's talking about. And we're interested in safety. And one of the things that we want to try and do is how do you get that helicopter up off the ground so people aren't endangering themselves or whatever. And so that's, that's what this project's all about. Anything else? Yes, sir. I was just looking at the, uh, your crystal ball, the 2020, um, <coughs> we'll be able to get back you know, in terms of production to well, I'm not an economist, <laughs> and uh, you know that's it, it's so funny. I mean, if it, you guess one way, I mean, who knows what's going to happen, right? Uh, we've had it. We, for whatever reason, we've gotten off to a really strong start, and we're seeing it in particular in the R66. So, you know, right now I'm very optimistic that that's that's a chip shot, but um, you never know, and we'll have to see. Uh, what's going so I mean every year as it builds along and you know there's a lot of weird political things going on that I don't want any part of you know so I don't know how that affects sales in all the different countries in the United States and and you can never forget we do export over 70 percent so depending on how the various countries are doing it really can impact our sales one way or the other so all right, well, with that, I again encourage all of you to, uh, to stop by our booth and say hello, and I, I'm more than happy to stay around and answer any questions that anybody would like to bring to me. And thank you again for coming.